Welcome to First. I'm Shirley Min along with Michelle Polston and Mark Eichmann. There's an organization in Dover trying to help the homeless. The idea may seem small, but it could produce some big results. Finding a positive result in the cure for hepatitis is here. The problem is whether there are enough people to justify an extremely high price tag. A Middletown small business owner discovered she could cover the price tag for a home health care service better than big organizations. We'll show you how she does it. First, your public media news magazine starts now. The tiny home movement is growing in popularity across the country. Tiny living typically, it's about downsizing and living simply. But two Dover women think that tiny homes could be the answer to solving Delaware's growing homeless problem. Here's our first look. This tiny home measures 10 by 20 feet. That's 200 square feet of living space total. Tiny indeed. But Sue Harris says giving someone with nothing 200 square feet to call his own can make all the difference. There was such a dire need for the next step in getting out of the, the homeless cycle, and that was affordable housing and the need for somewhere for these folks to be able to transition to after they've come out of the shelter. So she and friend Kathy Copera started Port Hope, Delaware in February, a nonprofit with an alternative approach to housing. Their idea? Tiny homes for the homeless. Harris believes tiny living will put a stop to the getting help, getting a job, can't find a home, wind up back in the street cycle she's all too familiar with through her work with the Dover Interfaith Mission, a homeless shelter. And housing isn't the only answer, but without housing, there all the other problems that are solved kind of fall behind the wayside if you end up back in the street again. So it is a huge part of the puzzle. Partnering with Victory Church in Dover, the pilot plan calls for 15 tiny homes for 15 people to start, like this one, equipped with a living space, pull-out bed, bathroom, kitchen, and utilities. We would have gardens and fruit trees and berry bushes and rain catchment systems and solar panels, we're hoping, to make it as self-sufficient and self reliant as it possibly can. The micro homes would sit on land donated by the church and be named Village of Victory. Apropos, since they're teaming up with Victory Church, which has a robust homeless ministry of its own, the church prepares and feeds 150 meals for the homeless every day. And Victory over chronic homelessness for just $12,000 a pop. That's how much Harris estimates it'll cost to build one tiny home with donated lumber and help from volunteers. Each one of these units can be built for what it might cost for one hospital stay for pneumonia that a lot of these folks in the streets end up with. Each year, the Homeless Planning Council of Delaware conducts a one-night count of the homeless in the state, a snapshot of what the problem looks like in Delaware. In 2015, the nonprofit found 950 people experienced homelessness in the state, 151 in Kent County. In 2016, that number grew to more than 1,000 in Delaware, with 188 in Kent County. We can, in Delaware, really get a handle on this. We've got three counties. We can start with Kent County and spread out. Some zoning and septic issues have delayed the project for now, but Sue Harris says if she can get things up and running again, this stretch of land is where she would like to put all 15 tiny homes when all is said and done. But some neighbors have started a no tiny homes movement, posting signs in their yards. I knocked on some of their doors, but no one would speak with me or answer. They think we're going to be bringing in, you know, murderers and rapists and all those things that maybe the stereotype of, of homeless people are. But Harris says anyone being considered for the village would undergo a background check and it would be an alcohol and drug free environment. And we'll know everything about these guys. We'll know which are the best fits, who will fit in a community situation like this and who will cooperate with each other. Um, anyone causing trouble will, as they say, be voted off the island. Harris says neighbors were also upset that she nor Appling gave them a heads up beforehand. She apologized for that, but says plans were leaked before they were ready to go public. It's an excellent idea. They're trying to put people in a place. 
Alexis Sims is homeless. The 21-year-old suffers from lupus and recently got out of an abusive relationship. The autoimmune disease robbed Sims of her vision, causes joint pain and damaged her skin. She's not eligible for a tiny home because she has her two-year-old and her mom with her, plus a baby on the way. They're all homeless, victims of bad circumstances. Appling and Sims have gone through the proper channels to find her a place to live, but to no avail. We took her down to the city council. She pled her case in front of the entire city council, the mayor, and we thought, well, somebody's going to do something. When nothing happened, I said, hey, I'm going to go buy you an RV and we'll put you back here in um, the back of the church and you can stay in there until we find you a place. And so that's what we did. Now the church is in trouble. Kent County issued a zoning violation to Victory Church for setting up a commercial recreational campground. Now they're being fined $100 a day. We're people. We're humans. We, we eat like regular people. We breathe like regular people. Some people look at us as a, as a disease or something because we're homeless. We're regular people. And just as like everybody else want a warm place to stay, so do we. You know, everybody wants these guys to take care of themselves. Well, we want to set up a system that they can. Progress has stalled on the Tiny Homes Project for now, but Harris says if she gets the green light, she'd like to charge $300 a month for rent. Now, while this would be the first in Delaware, tiny house villages have popped up in Nashville, Portland, Seattle, Dallas, and the list is growing. It's really becoming a national movement to address what advocates say is a nationwide lack of affordable housing. Coming up on First, home health care can be complicated. A Middletown woman found a way to make it less so. Her story is ahead in six minutes and we'll stay in Middletown for our first experience. Go behind the scenes at your creation station. As Congress debates the Affordable Care Act, we thought it would be a good time to revisit a story we presented last fall. It has to do with a cure for hepatitis C. On the surface, that should be good news. The problem is cost and the fact that there are so few people who need the drug. Alana Gordon from WHYY-FM's The Pulse has the story. Green lives in Millville, Delaware, and for a long time, she just wasn't feeling right. She had intense fatigue, nausea. No one could figure out what was wrong. Then a specialist ran a bunch of blood tests last year. Green came back positive for hepatitis C. I was fairly shocked because I, I, I wasn't that knowledgeable about the disease. I mean, everybody knows, you know, hepatitis is not a good thing. It, it affects your liver. So, um, you know, I went home and did some reading about it and um, it, was, it was pretty scary. Hepatitis C is transmitted through blood to blood contact. Green isn't sure how she got it, but she thinks it could have been from a transfusion 30 years ago. That's when she gave birth to her son. And it was before the blood supply was screened. In general, injection drug use is also a big risk. After getting over that initial shock of the diagnosis and the stigma often associated with the disease, Green was relieved. I was happy to know that, okay, this is what's wrong with me now. Next step, let's get it fixed. She has Medicaid. She and her doctor submitted the paperwork for the new drugs. She learned they could rid her of the virus in just a few months. But the excitement only lasted two weeks. That's when my first denial came back. Green was basically told she wasn't sick enough. She had these other symptoms, but her liver, the primary organ that hepatitis C attacks, was healthy. Green appealed. She was denied again. She connected with lawyers. Why would you make me wait? Especially it's rationing. I mean, it's pure and simple in my mind. When these new drugs came out, Delaware, like many states, created restrictions on who could access them. They prioritized those with the most severe liver damage. The conversations with patients sometimes were a little bit uncomfortable because I couldn't, I couldn't inform them how long their wait would be. Dr. Bill Mazur has had a lot of talks with patients in this situation. He explains how hepatitis C works. A person can have it for decades without symptoms. This is n normal, healthy liver tissue, um, uniform in color, uniform in texture. Um, after, on average, approximately five years, a person's liver will, will show uh, scar tissue. Uh, this is, again, meant to, to show sort of the entire liver, but the scar tissue is, is throughout the liver tissue. Um, and then in, in more advanced stages, we see more and more scar tissue. And at some point in time, we begin to see nodules forming. 
Um, and so as you, can, as you can imagine, as compared with the healthy part of the liver, um, there's less and less healthy liver tissue remaining to conduct the necessary functions of the liver. Functions like filtering out toxins. Stephen Groff, Delaware's Medicaid director, says, sure, it's ideal to treat everyone before their livers get to that state, but that's a lot of people. Here we have this cure, um, but the cost is over, uh, about $100,000 for a, a treatment episode of about 12 weeks. Um, so how do we begin to address what that's going to do to our budgets? Graf says some cancer drugs might cost more than these new hepatitis C drugs, but far fewer patients need them. Last year, the state spent more than $13 million to treat just 150 or so Medicaid patients with hepatitis C. He estimates there are about 2,000 more on the Medicaid rolls. This was a situation where we had high cost, high volume, just not a good combination. He says there were just too many unknowns initially. But this is where things get interesting. Graf says as more drugs have entered the market, that means more competition. The mitigating factors helpful to us are the fact that the cost of the drugs have come down. Now that there are competitors out there, I believe we have five products now um, available to the public. Uh, the manufacturers are now offering supplemental rebates to states, which they didn't do originally. Delaware and other states are also facing new pressures to ease their restrictions. Now that the drugs have been out for a while, new medical guidelines have affirmed their effectiveness and recommend early treatment. The federal government has also reminded Medicaid programs that they're obligated to cover any medically necessary treatment. This is our new policy, and it explains how we're going to phase in over the period of the next 18 months. Access Earlier this year, Delaware began to ease its rules on who could access the drugs. And more recently, the state rolled out a plan to further lift those restrictions so that people with less or even no liver damage will qualify for treatment in the coming months and year. This is where we always wanted to go and where we knew we were going. We're just happy that we're getting there a little faster. Graf thinks the budget impact will actually be manageable, so long as everyone doesn't rush in all at once to get treated. Oh, I think it's fabulous. I think it's wonderful. For Valerie Green, who was diagnosed with hepatitis C last year and denied treatment, she's hopeful she'll be eligible this time. She recently reapplied and is looking forward to getting back to living a productive life. I think I can actually get back to work again and, get, and um, have the full-time position again and um, be able to actually go out with my friends and be able to, you know, just have a normal life. For her, that also includes raising awareness about the disease and the resources that are available for getting tested and treated. That's Ilana Gordon reporting. She also wants to point out that for doctors like Bill Mazur, it means when he applies through the state, his requests won't be denied as often. And just to clarify, Dr. Mazur was speaking to us as an expert on hep C treatment and not as Valerie Green's physician. The manufacturers of these drugs will argue it costs a lot to test them and to bring them to market. Also, if you're on, say, an HIV medication plan, that costs $30,000 a year. Can't get enough of FIRST? Well, we have a solution. Go to whyy.org slash FIRST. You can watch this show now. Past shows are there too. Don't forget, you can also watch us on demand with Comcast. The home health care industry in the United States is projected to grow substantially over the next few years as the general population ages. A Middletown woman's personal experience with home health care services led her to start her own business in which she hopes she can offer better services than she received. They were very, very personable and because of that, it made it easier to transition from one company to the next company. And it um, lessened my fear about actually having to go be placed in a facility because I didn't want to be in a facility. Marcy Wilson Baines has been with Shore Care of Delaware for a year. Being able to maintain her independence was important to her. Shadeja comes in in the morning. She helps me with my ADLs, which is my acti normal activities. She helps me get uh, dressed. Um, I do a lot of it on my own. She basically sets things up for me. She's my legs. 
Wilson is like a lot of people who are opting to receive care at home. According to the Commission on Long-Term Care, the number of people needing help with their daily living activities will jump from 12 million to 27 million by 2050. It's a growing industry and um, the baby boomers are hitting the age where they're going to eventually need care. A baby boomer herself, Jackie Lesky, first became interested in home health care when her mother took ill. Well, sure care actually was um, an inspiration of mine from years ago when my mother got sick. I was 12 years old and she was diagnosed with MS. Jackie and her father cared for her mother at their home. It was that experience that helped shape the core of her business. Consistency is a strong foundation that you need to give the family comfort as well as the person you're caring for. Jackie watched as different health care providers would show up and some, she says, were inappropriately dressed. You know, you need to make a family feel comfortable. I wanted to make sure that the girls know that, you know, we want to be professional, we want to be respected, you know, to wear your proper attire, which is our business attire, which is scrubs. Jackie makes a personal connection with every potential client before she and her staff assign a caregiver. I meet the family and I meet the person we're going to care for. And then I can get and draw from the feeling like I know in my heart, like I know what they need. With the family focus approach, it's not surprising that Jackie's husband, Ben, plays a role in the business. I do the day to day banking business stuff, uh, bill paying, you know, uh, like I said, we have a van. I do the I actually do the, the, the van transportation myself. The key for everyone at Shorecare, from its owner and president to its health care aides, is listening. We're not that big, you know, but I mean, still communication and making sure that you know, the customer is taken care of and we're tailoring to what they want or adjusting to what they need. And Marcy agrees. I'm a people person, and so I like people that's going to talk. I like it if I'm able to call the office. I want them to talk to me. I want them to know me, and I want to be able to know them so they know my needs as well as I know what they're offering to me. Last year, the Small Business Administration recognized Jackie with the Woman Own Business of the Year Award. Art can be an expensive hobby. Think about what it takes to do painting or ceramics. Imagine what goes into fused glass or even tie-dye. What if there was a place you could go that had everything you needed to create whatever you wanted? First Experience introduces you to the man behind your creation station in Middletown. Just bring your creativity. They have everything else. My name's Steve Datz, and I own Your Creation Station. We're a paint your own pottery studio. We're more like we're becoming a walk-in art studio. Walk in, pick the project you'd like to work on, and then start. We'll do pretty much anything. We concentrate on paint your own pottery is the bulk of it. I'm a potter myself, so that's how we started, and that's the main focus. Right from like first grade, all through elementary school, junior high school and high school, I had clay. So I was just exposed to it very early on and loved it. Uh, I got through high school playing football and making pottery. We get all ages come in from very young babies whose hands and feet will press into clay. I have one customer I'm thinking about, I haven't seen her in a while, but she was in her late 90s. Uh, and she would bring her great granddaughters in and do projects and stuff. But it's really for everybody. As long as you're okay with your three-year-old painting something, I am too. It's really a very family-oriented kind of thing. This store kind of grew itself. I mean, my idea was, you know, pottery and then maybe have some other stuff here and there. But I didn't know what the other stuff was going to be. It was really been dictated more or less by the customers coming in and saying, hey, we'd like to kind of do this. get a lot of people come in saying I'm not an artist I'll never be able to do this and they walk out with the most spectacular things so it's neat to be able to see in, in any age I mean you see it in kids you see it in adults something they thought that was beyond their reach really is within their reach um, and it, you don't have to reach very far to get it and it's kind of neat to see that in people
There's certainly a financial aspect to it, but that's not the biggest reward with having a store like this. I mean, people like it, have embraced it. Um, it brings back childhood for some people. I mean, everybody comes in and says, oh, when, we, you know, when I was a kid, we did it, and you know, I did too. These kinds of places don't really exist anymore. This isn't really like work. I mean, I listen to my friends talk about sitting in the meetings and all the corporate this and that, and, the, and I tell them, oh, geez, I gotta go, and I'm gonna be making 60 tie-dyes today out. You know, I'll sit out in the sun, maybe under a canopy, you know, with the breeze. It's really a one-of-a-kind place. There are lots of things to do at your creation station in Middletown, and they host lots of special events, too. You can find out more when you visit them on the web at yourcreationstation.com. Next week on First, we'll begin the first in an occasional series on fertility. For couples trying to conceive, one option could be in vitro fertilization. New research at the University of Delaware hopes to make that less expensive. That story and more next week on First. Don't forget, if you want up-to-the-minute Delaware news, you can find it at newsworks.org slash Delaware or at WHYYFM 90.9. That's First for this week. We thank you for watching. For Nichelle Polston and Mark Eichmann, I'm Shirley Min. Have a great week. Thank you.